God. We're thinking, we're thinking. What are you thinking about? <laughs>
why I put it in the smallest font I possibly could. <laughs> it's because I can't even read it. All right, no, I'm just kidding. It's just one of those things. So um, here's this first portion. It says pre-chase planning. So it, we are all suffering SDS. This is the perfect time to get together with your chase partners and say, what are we going to do if we come across a mass casualty incident? Okay, that's a good place to start. Then, I highly recommend, if you're a lone chaser, that's cool. I chase alone sometimes too, I get it. I mean, sometimes it's just more fun and it's educational. But it is really to your advantage to chase with another person, and not just in the same vehicle, for the same reasons that rescuers get trapped. All right, decide as a group how you wish to address incident commands. Do that before you start your chase season. How am I gonna respond, okay? What are our plans going to be? What is our strategy going to be so we can figure out our tactics? And then assign roles and tactics on how you're going to both respond and how you're going to communicate. I have two ham radios, one that's a handheld and one that's in my car. The one in my car would be highly inconvenient if I decided to go somewhere else other than by my car. So how am I going to communicate with my other friends? Can we have short range, you know, just family radio service, FRS receivers? That's possible. How am I going to do that? Then if a disaster occurs, the first thing is to find a safe place to stop. Now, what does a safe place look like? Well, one of the things is, number one, um, having been on a couple disasters, there's this wonderful odor of natural gas in the air. It actually is odorless. It's the sole threat it took. But nevertheless, that's a bad place to probably set up shop is where that's densest. Um, am I at the bottom of a hill? Believe it or not, that's a pretty bad location because as the cars and other vehicles are coming over that hill, we've all been chasers, right? Where we've seen people actually look like the Tukes of Hazard coming over a hill. And if you're at the bottom of the hill, you're, you're boss hop. Uh, so, you know, you've got to be really careful about where you set yourself up. Is oil or other fluids seeping towards where I'm at? Am I in a flood area? How much debris is around? It's hard to set up a triage area if you're dragging people through nails. Um, no personal experience there. Um, but that's what you got to do, and then set up a command post. What does a command post look like? It's an incident commander who then has other people who are going to begin to report to him. Those people are the operations officer, um, and I just lost my brain. The guy who's going to coordinate everybody. Um, logistics, thank you. Phenomenal. Awesome. So logistics and operations, those two people are going to respond directly to the incident commander who's going to be determining what the rescue is going to look like. The other guys are going to make it happen, and then they can have people below them. But having a central location where you're establishing a command post, that allows for when rescue shows up for you to integrate into that system. All right, so disaster response strategy, tactic operations, assign roles, and communication, big deal. And then when emergency services arrive, transitioning to the next incident commander. Check in once that happens with the logistics chief. So there will be a logistics chief for a mass casualty incident. If you wish to continue to help, you may actually have to leave the scene to be assigned. That sounds right weird, right? You're already in the place where things are happening, but you actually become an unwanted rescuer. So I'll share my own experience. In Joplin, I inserted myself in their emergency room. I was extraordinarily dysfunctional, because at the time I didn't really understand this principle. Okay, fortunately, I shunt, and just by dumb luck, I was ended up shunting into an area where I ended up being very effective. But had I checked in with the, with the proper people and been directed when I was called to do what I was supposed to do, I would have been much more effective. Instead, in some ways, I interfered. So don't do that. You want to integrate. And so that's where you're going to check in with the logistics office. And then before you leave a mass casualty incident, sign out. This is important. If people are showing up, get their name, get their call sign, get their cell phone, and when they leave, cross them off. Because one of the ways we determine if people, if rescuers are trapped, is through that system. It's a very important system. As you can see, it's a little complex. All right, why would you want to do this? Well, let's say you want to get better practice. Well, we have Bob over here, who is a cert certified guy um, up in the northwest end or northeast end of the city near Brighton. Yeah, Bob, Bob Heaton. 
You can talk to Bob afterwards. CERT teams allow you to begin to learn how to integrate these skills into your community. In fact, you can actually learn to do that. And so this is the CERT teams. The website for that is right off the people website, but it's, uh, it's a lot longer here. Basically, community emergency response teams are those who work to bring the community in line with the incident command system that's going on with professional rescue. And there you have training, which allows them to be more effective than what I've given you so far. Great idea to get involved with those. All right. Now, I'm going to shift gears briefly to just talk about first aid a little bit uh, in the time I have remaining. Corey, how are we doing time-wise? I think you've got 15 minutes. I've got 15 minutes. So this is going to be med school in 15 minutes. <laughs> All right. First assumption. Everyone's infected with something. That's the first assumption when you're dealing with first aid. Now, if you are willing to take the risk of using your bare hands and not wearing any eye gear with somebody who's bleeding, I'm just not that comfortable. Because I'm amazed at how much hepatitis C there is, hepatitis B. HIV still exists, folks. It seems to have dropped off the radar, but it's still raging. Body fluids carry these. So the first thing is, how comfortable am I with that? I'm not. So assume everyone's infected, always, and that will save your bacon. So that means wearing gloves and everything else. From a trauma standpoint, everyone has a head injury or a neck injury, especially if they're unconscious. So the head injury part's easy when they're unconscious. <laughs> That's assumed, right? But the neck injury part is forgotten about. So if you're busy manipulating someone to get them to a better place and you're jiggling their neck all over the place, even though you may save their lives, and that's good, you could end up causing them to become quadriplegic. So you have to take protection against people's necks being flopping around. <coughs> Best way to do this is don't move them. Don't move them. It's the best advice I can give you. Treat in place unless you know how to safely stabilize the neck and move the patient. Anybody who has any damage to their head, their scalp, anywhere on their scalp has a head injury, period, in a mass casualty incident. It's done. You have a head injury whether you have signs of concussion or not. So those people need to be watched very carefully. They cannot be rescuers. They need to be taken out, sat down, and watched. If they have a head injury, you need to ask them about their neck, because invariably the neck can also be affected. So the kids are pretty unique in this regard. So for example, the kids, the trauma that I saw in Joplin was devastating. The kids are mostly top heavy, right? So what happens is their head will accelerate um, and then they will get thrown down onto the ground and develop a head injury. Adults kind of topple all over ourselves. So all kids should be considered in a mass casualty incident to have head injuries. It's pretty ubiquitous. You gotta be very, very careful with these folks. All right, for impaling and crush injuries, because this happens to be a real common one too, you treat it in place, you don't move the victim. So impaling was a real common phenomenon, both in Joplin and elsewhere, um, in you know, these mass casualty incidents, where if something gets embedded in the person. Um, that's not a common, it doesn't have to be anything really dramatic. For me, anything that doesn't belong in my body, that's spearing out of my body, is considered slightly dramatic. <laughs> Slightly. So you, what you do is you don't remove them. You don't remove things because they could be like pressing up against an artery. And when you remove it, they'll start to bleed to death. <coughs> and interestingly enough, people who are crushed, you cause more harm getting them out than good. What happens when they're crushed is there's tons of damaged tissue. And as soon as you remove the pressure, you know, I apply pressure to stop bleeding. As soon as you take that pressure off, they'll begin to hemorrhage internally. And so even if it looks like the best thing in the world to do, if somebody appears partially crushed, even if it's just a small portion of their leg, you want to wait until there's appropriate medical individuals around to help you with that. Because they are going to be. And crush injuries can cause all kinds of different problems. You need to treat them in place until EMS arrives. All right, for bleeding. So direct compression is always the right answer unless it doesn't work. But if you are have somebody who is bleeding and hemorrhaging a great deal, it turns out you really have to apply an incredible amount of direct pressure in order to get the bleeding to stop. Direct pressure is still, even if you think you're not doing any good, 
direct pressure isn't the deal. How long do you keep direct pressure going? You keep going until EMS takes over. If you have somebody who's bleeding enough to require direct pressure, you need to maintain direct pressure indefinitely. It's not, oh, it looks like it's slowed down. I'll just peel back to this beautiful scab I just helped you form <laughs> to see it bleed some more. You need to just try and hold pressure. That's the single best treatment. Tourniquets are rarely the right answer. If somebody has a mangled extremity or something along those lines, get training on how to do a tourniquet. They're not that hard to do, but you want to make sure that it's absolutely indicated because once you put a tourniquet on, you never take it off, and chances are anything distal from the tourniquet is going to be lost. You're going to kill it. All right, so um, just a few more things that will lighten it up a little bit. Um, people struck by lightning. Uh, when I was in Java, I was amazed at the RFD, the intensity of the electricity that was in the air. I've never seen lightning bolts. They don't appear visually, they probably much bigger than that. Traveling sometimes 10 yards, 20 yards in the cloud. It gives it the staccato lightning like I've never seen in my entire life. Um, electrical injuries are going to be pretty common. And chasers routinely uh, are lightning rods. Um, I know I make myself into one uh, because, you know, statistically, what are the odds, right? But we have a ton of chasers who get struck each year. <coughs> Good news on lightning strikes is 75% of people who get struck by lightning will survive. That's great news. That does mean 25% die. And I suspect those numbers are higher because the people who get struck don't have anyone else around them to help rescue them, right? So this is where chasing in packs comes in. Um, but in any case, if, in, if let's say a lightning strike hits a lot of different people, there's different ways that can happen through step currents, things that are really cool to talk about that are on focus today. Multiple people can go down at one time. When that happens, the people you treat first are the ones who appear deceased. When you're in a mass casualty incident, it's reversed. If somebody looks deceased, they're deceased. You're done. And that can be really hard. The only time you can actually start CPR in a mass casualty incident is if you have the resources to do so and it will not compromise care to somebody else. So this is a heartbreaking deal. We want to help everyone, but we have to stay focused on the living. All right, I'm going to talk about CPR just briefly and then I've got a couple videos to go. Um, but, you know, learn CPR. You can get certified online. You don't have to actually go in and do anything if you don't need the card. You can learn how to do CPR, and I'm going to teach it to you in just a few minutes. Okay? So this will be cool. We'll be practicing on uh, Tim. No. Uh, <laughs> he's yeah, yeah, it's over. He's good. He's good. He's good. Once he said doctor to me, I knew he was done. All right. So what does compression-only CPR look like? Well, back in 19... No, I take it back. Back in 2007, the American Heart Association <coughs> got rid of rescue breathing as the primary modality of CPR, where you would do 15 compressions and two rescue breaths. You don't have to do any rescue breaths anymore. And why did they do that? Because people were kind of averse to the idea of putting their lips against a stranger, depending on the stranger, putting their lips against a stranger, providing two breaths, and then doing chest compressions. It's far easier to get rescuers engaged in doing chest compressions. And guess what? The scientific data on this, this is my other area of expertise, show that compressions alone are the single most effective form of treating somebody in cardiac arrest. If you come across somebody who appears unconscious, who may not be breathing, you still are better off doing chest compressions, in parentheses, unless they're a kid. If they're a child, it's always respiratory. You have to worry about the respiratory. But adults, you come across somebody who's down, you don't ever have to do mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, ever. <coughs> you can just do chest compressions. We call this compression-only CPR, <coughs> which is weird because CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation, but it's really only for the cardiac part. I won't go into why it's so cool, but it's really cool. So anyway, um, but we're going to do compression-only CPR. Now, the cool part about compression-only CPR is the way you know how fast to go is based on the song, Staying Alive. So we'll just visit our friends at the office. Go ahead and give it up. To Pump to the Tune of Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. Do you know that song? Yes, yes, I do. I love that song. <clears throat> First I was afraid I was petrified. <laughs> Staying alive, staying okay, yeah, so not that part of the song, but more importantly, the staying alive portion of the song. So, a couple of rules on chest compressions. When you're doing them, there are, there are several rules, and th this is what I teach when I teach CPR. There's basically five rules you need to follow, okay? And those same five rules are the same rules that you bring to a good marriage, okay? Ready? 
push hard, pump fast, have good recoil, okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't stop, all right? That's what, so, and, and go fast. So, here we go. So, as my wife often will tell me that I'm probably only doing CPR for a minute or two on most of my patients. <laughs> With age, I've been blessed with the ability to go, anyway, it's not important. It's not important. Sorry, not, not important. When you do chest compressions, you want your shoulders over the nose and over the belly button, okay? And you lock your arms and you drop with your belly. People who try to use their arms in this motion over time, and depending on how many push-ups you do on a daily basis, will start doing this. Which is not exactly the most effective form of compression, but does move to the rhythm of staying alive. Now, I may not be doing it very good justice, but I want you to remember, push hard, okay? There is no such thing as too hard a chest compression. Pump fast, you're going to go fast, have good recoil, and don't stop. I don't remember what the fifth one is, honestly, but the fourth one is pretty important. Don't stop. If you start, don't stop until they're screaming out. So, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at how it's done correctly. This is actually from the American Heart Association. This is how it's supposed to go. Kim Jong is going to take us there. Here we go. Slingshot. It's definitely a moment. Wait, what is my way? You Shirt man. The heart attack symbol. Jessica, baby Jessica, who was down in the well. <coughs> Remember this? 
What's funny is about like half the group was like, there was a baby Jessica win now, back in the 1940s or something. Um, you damn new chasers. Um, so anyway, this was in the 80s. There, a girl fell down the well, uh, a deep well in Texas, I think in Midland actually, and uh, was rescued. This guy here, I think his name was Robert. Um, uh, he received an incredible amount of fame for what he went through at that time. And then several years later, he committed suicide. He had never processed how that disaster response for him had affected him emotionally. And it bit him hard. And the reason I tell you this is because we've had suicides in the chasing community. They may not have had anything to do with chasing property, but the demons we have in our closets, they begin to add up unless you shed light on them. And then they vaporize. My encouraging word to you is, talk about it. Find someone you can talk to, particularly a trained counselor, if you come across this, because this is a big deal thing, you know? We have an inflated sense of responsibility. We feel that if somebody dies on our watch, it's our fault. Or that if we didn't do enough, if we did more. It's not true. If you stop and try to help in a meaningful way, you guys are heroes, whether you're ever recognized for that or not. Take care of yourselves, too. All right, so... That happy note. Um, remember the preparation and planning. Talk with your partners about how do you, you intend to respond to tragedy and then start planning now. Understand ICS and consider becoming a member of a CERT team in your area. <coughs> Heroic actions are those that don't endanger more lives, including and especially yours. Right? Know your limitations and accept them. Talk to some trained and debriefing rescuers if you're faced with tragedy. Um, so, uh, that, this just was not a tragedy. This was like a complete mesoscale accident that happened here. This was actually on June 4th of this past year near Deer Trail, Colorado. This remarkable splitting storm with incredible striations, which was uh, near Deerfield, Colorado, on I-70. Those were the two <coughs> big pictures I got out of this year. Thank you very much, Pilgrim folks. Um, so <laughs> they're both not very impressive compared to that. But I want to open it up for any questions if anyone has them. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, uh, there are exceptions to that, but they're very rare. 
The single most dangerous is blood. But um, keep in mind that it is very, very hard. Sometimes we don't see the blood. So for example, patients with hepatitis C are encouraged <coughs> not to use the same toothbrush as their spouse because there's bleeding that occurs. So there's bleeding that occurs. We don't see it. I certainly don't, don't brush to the effect that I see blood and I spit out, right? But, but people who do have this, it can be very minute. So that means that when I look at saliva next, um, that's actually one of those areas where there, that can be easily mixed with blood and you wouldn't even know it. But most diseases, fortunately, are not transferred by the GI tract. Um, so that, so stool, urine.